on that. But I... Yes! If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays that's sweeping the nation? But it only is. real fans, true hardcore fans who have been with us since day one, would know two things about you and I, two undeniable facts, really real facts, and in no way made up on the spot facts, about the both of us, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and Steve. First and foremost, Bunny, the first fact about you is the fact that when you're not doing the podcast, you are, in fact, a stewardess. So tell us, Bunny, what was it that made you want to become a stewardess? Well, let me tell you, we're talking about back in the day, and my ass looked so good in that miniskirt. You know? Uh, that's a spicy meatball. I didn't necessarily like get it, it getting pinched, but but it Hard was the, the look I was going for, you know. Yeah. So that was the big attraction back in the day, much like these Star Trek uniforms. From what from what some of the female actresses had had to say. Uh, but yeah, it was really the outfit, and it was, like, stewardess was as close as you can get to, to, like, corporate hippie. You know? They yeah. liked kind yeah. of portraying stewardesses as, as just swinging young girls, you know? They're in a new city. They're out about the town. You know? Yeah. So, that that was also part of, you know, selling, so like part of me wanting to become the stewardess was not only how great my ass looked, but, but the lifestyle it was presenting to me. You know? From yeah. being a, a a small girl in Nebraska, you know? Yeah. Shucking corn my whole life. Shucking corn. Yeah. I look amazing right now. They, they do that in Nebraska, I don't they? <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this part of the show is find a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know that well, and reword it by my own unique storytelling style. Okay. No. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximation! Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not, Personally, I like the name Shaf. It's short, it's loud, it's spirited. It's the youngest daughter of podcast segments. It's <laughs> It's the Eleanor of podcast segments. Anywho, this week on Shaf, we will be <coughs> discussing the life and career of TV legend Fred Silverman, his rise to fame, and the disastrous 1979 midseason that nearly destroyed his career. It's a shap quote because it is loosely tied in with our last chap about the screwing of actor Norman Fell. We'll get to Norman again in so just a little bit. So it's it's more of a it's more of a, a a three mothers trilogy than what you would think kind of, of as a traditional trilogy. Kind of. Where I I feel that this chap is just expanding on what happened to Norman Fell. In all honesty. But we'll get to there. But first, we need to talk about Fred Silverman, a television legend. You might be thinking to yourself, who's Fred Silverman? I don't know him, so he must not be a legend. So here's a fun fact for you. You know, the who's the leader of the Scooby-Doo gang? Fred, okay. Fred Jones, named after Fred fucking Silverman. Really? That is a fact that Fred for 
from the Scooby Gang was named after Fred Silverman. That's how big of a deal Fred Silverman is. Fred Silverman is. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Fred Silverman never wore ascots or talked to dogs, but still, Fred Silverman is a big deal. He was born in New York City, half Jewish, half Catholic. He grew up in Queens. His dad repaired radio and TVs. So even in the beginning, there was a slight connection to television, and he continued his connection in college. He got a degree from Syracuse, and he got his master's from Ohio State. And his thesis was a 400-page in-depth analysis of the last 10 years of ABC television programming. Who okay. the fuck has that as their, as their, as their uh, thesis for college? God damn. That, and that was before the internet. Yeah. Shit. God damn. So already, god damn Fred Silverman. This thesis earns him a job at WGN in Chicago, the Superstation. <laughs> I love WGN in Chicago because it is a local Chicago TV station that in the 80s and 90s, if you had cable, you also had this one small time Chicago TV station. Yeah. So, like, I grew up knowing who the bleacher bums were. Yeah. I grew up as, like, a 12-year-old who could do a decent Harry Carey impression before fucking Will Ferrell came along? You know, like like yeah. I knew who Bozo the Clown was in 1983. <laughs> Even though I lived in Phoenix, and that really amazing. It's all because of WGN, the Superstation. From there, he moved to WPIX in New York City, and then the so big that's my time. stomping ground. Yeah, and he did so good there that that led to his big break, CBS. Uh, first, he was overseeing all daytime like, programs. What the fuck did oh. he do? I, like, I can't well, imagine what the C fuck he would have done. WPIX was fucking WPIX, you know? He was, he was, he was one of the people who was in charge of selecting programming for the network. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it, and so when he moved to CBS, he, his first job was o overseeing daytime programming. So you get to choose the talk shows in the morning, the news program. You get to choose what soap operas we run. And then after that, we're syndicated. Oh, stuff. shit. You he know what that fucking means? Huh? He was responsible for the Don Ho show. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Fucking probably. Yeah. Uh, so he's overseeing all daytime programming at CBS. It's 1970. And back then, at CBS, the guy who was overseeing all daytime, uh, who was overseeing all of the programming, period, was a guy named Michael Dan. And his idea was, okay, look, everyone right now is focusing on demographics, ages of people. Oh, we want to advertise to young people. We want to advertise to 25 to 39 year old. That's not how we used to do things back in the day. Back <laughs> in the day, it wasn't about demos and specific audiences. Screw all that. We're going back to the old days. Back then, it was just about getting viewers, plain and simple. We're going to throw all those demos out of the goddamn window and just try and get eyeballs watching television set. It's as simple as that. But the problem is, it's the 1970s, and, and uh, see, that is, it's a toy, but there is a tiny uh, uh, magnet in that, Eleanor, so please do not point it at any of these expensive things, okay? Okay, just as a favor to me, your other mother. So the problem is that it's the 70s, and advertisers are like, okay, Michael Dan, uh, fucking, we want to advertise to specific people now. We never did this before, but now it's the 70s, and shit, you mean to tell me we can advertise specifically to 18 to 34-year-olds? We can do that? We can, we can 
we can actually pinpoint our advertising now to advertise for specific people who watch specific shows at specific times. We don't want to do it the old way anymore, so advertisers started fleeing CBS because they were like, we're going to do things the way my grandfather used to do things. And like people don't want that shit anymore. So uh, CBS fired Michael Dan and boom, hey, Brad Silverman, you've been doing pretty good with the daytime stuff, and we all read your thesis, and uh, 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 here's the thing. CBS used to be in first place, and now we're in second place, and ABC is this unstoppable juggernaut. So we're going to give you a promotion, and this is why. We read your fucking thesis, and we want to take fucking ABC down. Yeah. And so... Michael Dan was doing things the old way. We fucking <coughs> fired him. You knew you're an up and comer. You know ABC programming better than anyone on the fucking planet. Do us a favor and help us get to number one again. So now, Fred Silverman is in charge of all programming. And the first thing he did was an actual thing that was a big deal at the time. And it was called the Rural Purge. Yeah. That was Fred yeah, Silverman. Yes, I know the Fred, purge. Fred Silverman comes into comes into power, and he's like, "I'm in charge of all the programming." Okay, let me look through all of ABC's programming. Why is there so much redneck shit on television that worked yeah. in the fifties, that worked in the sixties? It's the nineteen seventies. We we gave. Uh, you mean to tell me there's a show on TV called Mayberry RFD? Do you really think in the 1970s people want to see more of the Andy Griffith show in yeah. color? So he's like, the first thing we need to do, man, is, I mean, we have young people who are wanting to watch TV, and we've got all of this old-timey Green Acres shit, so the first thing we need to do is, is like, if we want young people to watch our network, we cannot have so many hours of programming a week dedicated to... So it was an actual thing that they called the Rural Purge. Green Acres, Yeehaw, the Beverly Hillbillies, Gomer Pyle, Mayberry RFD, Petticoat Junction, all canceled, all gone. And then the year after that, they would even cancel Lassie, Pat Buttram, the actor who played Mr. Haney on Green Acres, he yeah. literally was quoted as saying, CBS canceled everything with a tree in it. Oh! Including Lassie. And that was Fred Silverman's big idea, that like we need to get the redneck shit behind and focus instead on the hip people, the young people, the hip new generation. Of course, we're talking about the generation that will never die. Baby boomers. Yep. So, so he greenlit so many shows that he thought would be cool and marketable for young people and, and modern day people in the 1970s. He personally greenlit more upscale fare. The Sonny and Cher show. Kojak. All in the Family, MASH, Barnaby Jones, the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Yeah. That was all Fred Silverman. He was also really good at spotting spinoffs. He greenlit All in the Family. And he's like, I've got an idea for a show. Racist guy is racist. It's a fucking show. And it was a big hit. And so he, he, Fred Silverman was one of the first people to say, this show is a hit. Let's make another one. So, All in the Family is a hit. Oh, this one black family's uh, popular in it? Shit, give them a show. The Jeffersons. Yeah. This is now a show. It's a spin-off of uh, All in the Family. And, oh, what? People love fucking B. Arthur? Great. Give that bitch a show. Yeah. And that's mod. And then, the Mary Tyler Moore show gave birth to Rhoda. And then, All in the Family... Gave birth to Mod, and then Mod yeah. was, uh, you know, Mod was a sort of progressive woman, and so she was friends with a black family. What? And the black family was given a show, and that was Good Times. It was a spin off from a spin off of an original show. 
This is spin-off okay, wait, 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 wait. She, Maud was I not friends up. with a black family. Florida worked for Maud. Uh, Florida worse. was that's the maid. Florida. Oh, that's even fucking worse. But yeah, they gave, they gave, uh, they gave Florida a spinoff, and that was Good Times. That's like if Frazier gave birth to the show It's Not. Yeah. You know? Which I, I do think he had a spinoff for a little years. while. Huh? I do think he had a spinoff for a little while. Nope. Nope. He did not. But like all in the not. family, but so I'm no. sorry, but all in the family, like, like, much like Happy Days was kind of doing, they would bring on certain characters just to see if, like, maybe we can get a spin out, a spin off out of them. Like the Jeffersons Shit, was Morgan, the maybe, only we'll like get real. We'll get the Morkin. We'll get the yeah. We'll get the Morkin, Orkin, Laverne, and Shirley in a little bit. Yeah, like like FYI. the Jeffersons yeah. was the only like real legitimate spin off. They were fairly yeah. regular characters. They were the neighbors. If he had, they were recurring characters on the show. Uh, yeah. Maud came on as like either sister or cousin or some shit like that. Some bullshit reason to have her on the show. They liked the chemistry. Bang, spin off. Yeah, that was Fred Silverman. Fred or like, Silverman. Let's was try her like in another episode. Yeah. Fred Silverman was one of the first people to be like, hey, people like this character. Give him a show. Fuck it. You know? He was the first person to really do that. And so, uh, All in the Family gave a spinoff to Maud. Maud gave a spinoff to Good Times. And suddenly it's like, okay, yeah, sure. We'll have a black show for black people. And it's like, wait, blacks and whites are watching Good Times? Oh, damn. Okay, this is actually, we thought that this would be a show that, uh, you know, minorities would watch, but everyone is watching Good Time. Shit. Well, Fred Silverman's like, I think we finally might have something to take down fucking Happy Days. Because ABC was ha- wa- yeah. it had a, a golden goose in, uh, in Happy Days, and everyone's like, nothing can defeat the power of Happy Days. And it's like, yeah. But we can at least make it so that minorities won't watch Happy Days. We're putting good times uh, head-to-head against Happy Days. And it did finally start chomping at the ratings of the Golden Goose that was Happy Days. So Fred Silverman was the first person to like, oh, shit, Happy Days is bleeding. That means we can kill it. All hail Fred Silverman, the man who took down fucking Happy Days. So, uh... That's important. Put a pin on that for later. He also yeah. revitalized the game show world, and oh my god, this blew my fucking mind when I think when I found this out. Holy forking shirt mall. Okay, apparently, The Price Is Right started on NBC in 1956 and lasted for. Seven, eight, 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 for seven years until it was canceled. And then ABC said, oh, you canceled the prices, right? This is a big hit. We'll take it from you. And then ABC ran it for a few years, and then that didn't get good ratings, and so they canceled it. And the general idea was it was on NBC, and then it had bad ratings, and so they canceled it. And then ABC picked it up, and guess what? It had bad ratings there, so they canceled it. So this is what it is. (coughs) The Price is Right <coughs> is a dead game show. It's dead. No one will ever want to watch it again. No one will be watching this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 fucking years from now. No, The Price is Right is dead. It's dead. No one will ever want to just keep watching The Price is Right over and over again. And Fred Silverman went, Take a crack at it. And it's been a hit for four goddamn decades. And that was Fred Silverman. Yeah. 
I was blown away by that. Like, you mean to tell me this bounced around every network? And everyone was like, oh, the Price is Right is dead. No one will want to watch it again. Like, damn, Fred Silverman, like, good for you. Already, he's huge, and we haven't gotten to the main part yet. He also, because he was in charge of everything, he was a real nitpicker, and he went like, okay, now it's time to go through the Saturday morning shit. Okay, all of our cartoons are crap. All of them are boring. No one wants to come to CBS and watch these cartoons. You know what? I've got a friend in Hanna-Barbera. I'll give him a call. Beep, up, boop, up, beep. Hey, uh, uh, hey, uh, Hanna-Barbera people. Hey, it's me, Fred Silverman. Yeah, 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 we're all buddies. Look, um, I want something different for our channel. Something different. You know, I've, I watched all the cartoons we got on the network. I've watched all the cartoons from the other network. They're all happy, smiley. Everyone's having a good time. Everyone's having a great time. But you know what's not on TV right now for kids? Sometimes kids want to get a little bit spooked. Sometimes kids want to get a little bit scared. Fucking, can you make me a scary cartoon that's not scary? And he helped create fucking Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Goddamn Fred Silverman. And from that, Hanna-Barbera started working with CBS throughout the 70s. And before Fred Silverman took over, CBS was in second place in the rating, but under Fred goddamn Silverman, CBS finally beat ABC and became the number one network in America. Right. Now here's where it gets crazy. ABC is like, damn it, we're, we're in second place. We were in first place for so long, and now we're in second place. God damn it. And now we need to beat CBS? And be number one? Shit! We're losing the ratings. We need to turn this network around. But who could turn this network around? Who could do that? Who has experience with getting a network that's in second place and turning them into first place hit? Okay, I've got an idea. Hear me out. This is going to sound crazy. And so in 1975... Fred Silverman was made president of ABC. <laughs> How crazy is that? Suddenly Fred Silverman is in charge with helping to save Happy Days, which he was responsible for killing in the first place. Yeah. And he was the one who was like, shit, you don't want to watch Happy Days anymore? Okay, How about this? Then this is what we do. We use it for spinoffs. Fuck it. Let's get some characters in there. See if people like them. If they like them, we'll give them a hit. Hey, here, put these two wacky uh, chicks in there. Oh, people like them? Great. You have a show with Laverne and Shirley. I don't care. Do it. Let's have a show where I know it's in the 50s, but fuck it. What if we do an episode where there's an alien? It doesn't fucking matter. It's TV. Nobody cares. So, he, so, so yeah. yeah. Uh, it's all crazy, but he did it. He greenlit Charlie's Angel. The Love Boat. Eight is enough. Three's Company was his goddamn idea. So, Fantasy Island feud. He came up with Good Morning America, for shit's sake. <laughs> and he did spin off Magic again. He came up with the idea for the Bionic Woman, Laverne and Shirley. And this is crazy. Uh, in ABC, all of their Saturday morning cartoons were done by a company named Filmation. And uh, Fred Silverman fired them and were like, uh, hey, Hanna-Barbera. Uh, it's me, Fred Silverman. I'm in charge of ABC now. And uh, I know you're working for CBS, but could you also work for ABC? And that's why in the 70s, you saw Hanna-Barbera fucking everywhere. Yeah. Suddenly, Scoop, suddenly uh, Yogi Bear is in an arc uh, in the sky, uh, stopping uh, global warming. And then over here... Scooby Doo is uh, it, it, over here. Scooby Doo and Shaggy are in a, a, a the Laugh Olympics, and then yeah. over here, Yogi Bear is like in space, uh, doing a racing in space. And oh look over here, it's the all new Scooby Doo Adventures. Uh, CBS stopped doing Scooby Doo, so then Fred Silverman is like, let's do Scooby Doo on our network, and uh, then and then uh, CBS is like, hey, we had Scooby. -Doo we had Scooby-Doo, where are you? So you can't do Scooby-Doo. So, okay, then we'll do the new Scooby-Doo adventure. Shit, we'll team them up with Batman. We don't give a shit. 
<laughs> we'll take Scooby Doo from you. So that's why you would see the Scooby Scooby Doo. Where are you? But then suddenly you're seeing Scooby Doo and Scrappy, Scooby Doo and Vincent Price, yeah. Scooby Doo and fucking uh, the Harlem Globetrotters and shit. Yeah, that was Fred Silverman. Fred Silverman made CBS beat ABC, and then he jumped ship and made ABC beat CBS. Excuse me, you're making my boobs. You're making my big boobs fall. You unhooked one of my boobs from the back, and now I've got saggy boobs. Uh, and then made ABC beat CBS. So Fred Silverman was considered, at this point, the king of television. He couldn't lose. Then ABC fucked his shit up. Okay. Okay. Uh, because while CBS and ABC are, like, bitch-slapping each other for first place, NBC has been dead last for fucking forever. Horrible. It's all shit. It's a toxic network. No one is watching NBC. If it wasn't for Saturday Night Live, no one would give a shit about the entirety. Stop throwing cat around. I have talked to you about that already today. Stop Flinging the cat around, okay? It is not, not a doll that you can play with and throw around. It is a living, breathing human being. I'm going to get Andre the Giant to throw you around to see how you like it, okay? This is the second time I have said this. Please listen to me, okay? So the folks at NBC say, Fred Silverman did it twice, surely... He can do this a third time, right? Well, spoiler alert, no. <laughs> Fred Silverman was a success in CBS, then he was super successful at ABC, but apparently Fred Silverman couldn't pass up a challenge. And he's like, I'm leaving ABC. I'm becoming the president of CV and CEO of NBC, and I'm the golden god. No one can defeat Fred Silverman. I'm the king of all television. No yes. one can beat me. I cannot be stopped. So he comes in. I remember him ben... being a frequent Johnny Carson joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is why. Fred Silverman comes in and it's like, I've got a big vision. It's the all-new NBC. The all-new, all-different NBC. First thing we do, we cancel. Uh, we cancel. We, we redo all of the upcoming season. We're going to redo it. And it's like, okay, but Fred, you were just hired as CEO in, in uh, like, October, November. We already have a new slate of shows. They're out right now. We can't just cancel them and bring in your brand new vision for, for a, a whole wave of programming. The season has started. You'll have to wait until the end of 1979, um, we can't launch the all-new NBC now. So Fred Silverman's solution was, how about the mid-season? You know, every network has one to two uh, new shows that premiere on a network during the mid-season. He, he, he would have been responsible for Battle of the Network Stars. He was! He absolutely was. Okay, uh, and Circus of the Star. Okay, so before Fred Silverman came along, TV stations only had one to three mid-season shows premiere, and mostly it was just reruns of their popular shows. But Fred Silverman said, no reruns. An all-new slate of mid-season shows. I want at least 12 new shows to premiere in January of 1979. And this started, this inadvertently started a mid-season war between all the three networks. And suddenly CBS is like, oh man, we're really worried about Fred Silverman. We're really worried about this guy because he turned all the other networks around. He might turn around NBC. Okay, so what's he doing? 12 mid-season shows? Wait, 12, 11, 13 mid-season shows at NBC? Shit, we need to come up with as many as Fred Silverman had. And so the 1979 mid-season, where there would normally be five to six to seven new shows, now there were 36. Yeah. 36 new shows rushed to the mid-season lineup. It was a 36-star pileup. It was way too much. Too many new shows. 
and not that many wonderful ideas because it's less, let's come up with some original ideas for new shows and more shit we need to come up with shit to beat Fred Silverman. Yeah. So uh, at this point, you might be able to, to see why this is a shapful, a shap, uh, a, a sequel to last week's shap. Like, okay. Uh, okay, look. I know that you didn't want to do a spin-off. I know that you said, no, it's going to be a bad idea. Nobody's <laughs> going to watch it. But look, this is going to be a great idea, Norman. It's going to be great. It's going to be a smash hit. And because you uh, didn't want to do it for so long, we've had to postpone the premiere. But uh, it's premiering in, in mid-season 1979. It's no doubt going to be a hit and be picked up for a regular season because this is a big show that we're going to be premiering during the mid-season where there's hardly anything. So as long as a bunch of new shows don't premiere at the same time, then your show, The Ropers, is going to be around for a long time. Yeah. So here are some of the series that came and went across all three networks. Um, the David Naughton disco sitcom Making It. Yes. Making It. Making It. Making It. Uh, yeah. His Honor, all one word, spelled H-I-Z-Z-O-N-N-E-R, about the mayor of a small Midwestern town, which starred the big Lebowski, Jeffrey Lebowski, the other Lebowski, yes. the millionaire. So that was a big trip for me to see. Uh, fun fact, uh, Animal House was such a big deal at that time that every network had one fraternity sitcom. Yes. There was, oh, here's a sitcom about a wacky fraternity. Here's a sitcom called Brothers and Sisters about a wacky fraternity and a wacky sorority. It's totally different. NBC said, hey, we have, uh, we have Saturday Night Live uh, uh, on the network. Fuck it. We'll do the official Animal House show. Oh, we can't have the rights to Animal House? Okay. Loosely based on National Lampoon's Animal House, they premiered Delta House, featuring returning cast members, the Dean, and yeah. the Fat One, and no one else. No, no, no. D-Day. D-Day was part of the cast. Yeah, the the but, last remaining cool one. Yeah. But, uh, but, I think, who was the straight-laced guy? Oh, I don't remember. I do not remember. I saw sure the opening credits a couple he, of times. He was there as well. Early Michelle yeah. Pfeiffer yes. was in this. Yes. Yes. And uh, I, I remember, like, also, this is right at that age, man. Where I'm getting out of the house, yeah. kind of watching movies on my own, you know? Yep. And Animal House was a big fucking movie. And yep. one of the first videos to steal. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, but you Delta think, you house, think that, like... Delta House was, like, somebody who didn't get it. Like, yeah. you had the dressing. It yeah. looks like Animal House. I'm not completely happy with the cast, but, like, yeah, like they didn't like, get the humor. Yeah, it's like you ordered Animal House on Wish. Mm -hmm. And that's what you got. There was also a spinoff of Columbo called Mrs. Columbo, starring a young Captain Janeway, Yes. The Stalker Channing Show. Fresh uh, off the called? soap opera Ryan's Oak. Into oh. Mrs. Columbo. I didn't write it down, but there was a romantic comedy starring some woman I don't remember and the hero from Airplane. I don't remember... I don't remember what the sitcom was called, but it was like a romantic comedy about this new couple, and, and they it's have problems. It's who and who? I, maybe? 
maybe. I saw I saw a wonderful compilation of all of the opening credits of all thirty six new shows. Yeah. So I saw the opening credits for every show. I found it on YouTube, and it's a really great video. Oh, yeah, I do that from time to time, yeah. Yeah, it shows a a commercial for His Honor, the opening to Delta House, and it shows everything, and it was really neat. Apparently, there was also a Little Women TV show based on the book and obviously trying to be the next Little House. Yeah. And that's a smart move. Little House is such a big book that's like shit. Give me another book. <laughs> Give me the rights to another book. So they did Little Women, and it's like, good for you, but also, no. No, yeah. it, that didn't work. One of the biggest failures was the sitcom Hello, Larry, starring McLean Stevenson from MASH. And, and NBC promoted it as America's next big comedy smash hit. And it was such a big hit. They were certain that that the, the sitcom Hello, Larry would be such a huge hit that it was paired with the most expensive television show made at the time, Super Train. Yeah. Poor McLean Stevenson, man. They, he yeah. gave his life in a chopper crash so he could to get do his own Hello, Larry. Show. Yeah, so he could get his own show, which was absolutely just not yeah it just wasn't there and yeah. like what I, I I moved into a new town and I have to live with my ex-wife wah, wah, wah. like okay that's not the most original idea for a show but like oh we're in the case McLean Stevenson but they were so certain that Hello Larry would be a hit that they teamed it with their expensive new show, Super Train, which was so expensive for 1979 that Super Train almost bankrupted the entire network. No. Super Train and Hello Larry were advertised as, w- as NBC's big new shows and both spectacularly failed. Other high-profile NBC failures that uh, uh, Fred Silverman did at the time included the show Sweepstakes, The Big Show, which... The only big show I know chokeslams people, so I don't know the show. show. (coughs) But I do know Fred Silverman's other big idea, Pink Lady and Jack. (laughs) This is going to be such a huge hit. Oh, man, we're going to be swimming in money like Uncle Scrooge. We've talked about. Yeah, Super Train. Yeah, Super Train was hugely hyped. Hugely hyped. And yeah. it was just another take on Love Boat, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, but with an expensive-ass train. And, of course, another high-profile failure from Fred Silverman during this time is something we'll talk about next week. A little thing known only as NBC, as FL1980. But we'll be talking about that next week. Um, But they're both making this. Breaking up a bit. Okay, funny. Are you there? There you are. Fuck. Okay. 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 So you're there. We're back. Yes. We're back. Yes. Okay. We are back. Okay. So uh, Fred Silverman almost bankrupted the entirety of NBC. And uh, one of the big things he's known for is a little fight that he got with one of the cast members of SNL, which led to uh, 
the creation of NBC of of Saturday Night Live 1980, which is considered the worst season of Saturday Night Live and almost cancels the entirety of the show Saturday Night Live. We'll yeah. be talking about that more next week on Shap. But the surprising thing is, is that yes, Fred Silverman's tenure on NBC was disastrous, and he almost bankrupted the entire network. But there were throughout the disastrous 1979 midseason there actually were a very small amount of hits. From the mid-season, yeah, we got three different comedies about fraternities, but we also got um, uh, Fred Silverman canceled all of our redneck shows. Shit, and now he's in NBC. Maybe we should make a redneck show? because You know, as sort of an F you to Fred Silverman because he did the rural purge, maybe we should do... Uh, a redneck show. How about one where I don't know two brothers are running from the law and and they've got a Confederate car. I don't oh. know. So fucking the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, also came from were came from the 1979 midseason, along with BJ and the Bear. Real people. Yeah. Oh, I love I love that Denise Crosby, John Davidson. I watch that all the time as a fucking kid. Uh, and also, following Different Strokes was a sitcom, following Hello Larry was a sitcom called Different Strokes, and that became such a big hit, and NBC noticed that, like, okay, uh, Hello Larry is bombing, but Different Strokes is a hit, so, uh, they started doing crossovers, and throughout the first and second season of Different Strokes, uh, Hello Larry shows up. <laughs> and apparently McLean Stevenson and the dad from Different Strokes, oh, we were buddies together in the war. And that was a way to try and use Different Strokes to save their golden goose sitcom, Hello Larry. But, uh, yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh, oh, yeah. But, yeah, out, out of... But, yeah, the the the... 1979 midseason is like a disastrous moment in television history, which was all Fred Silver. You're cranking down again. fault, by the way. He thought that he was a golden dude. You know. Wrong. Down. And it's, it, oh, hey. Okay, then. Uh, sure, everything will go fine for you, Fred. Oh, shit. Okay, let me do something. I've got something up here, but let me see if I take this off, if everything will be better. Okay, it's you hearing down. me now? Yeah. Okay. It should be good now. Are you hearing me? Yep. Okay. So, yeah. It was uh, actually disaster- sounding kind of cool, though. Oh, yeah? Awesome. So, yeah, the disaster. Silverman, the golden goose. It okay, sounded well, pretty awesome. fucking awesome. That's awesome. Well, okay, so uh, the disastrous 1979 midseason, it was all Fred Silverman's fault. Way to fly close to the sun there, Icarus. Uh, 36 new shows, and only a small handful of those survived. And out of those that survived, a number of them would get a second season purely out of stubbornness, only to be canceled after the second season. And again, we're really sorry, Mr. Fell. We sincerely apologize. Um, and again, whose fault is all of this? Fred Silverman. It is all entirely his fault. He's well known for causing the disastrous 1979 midseason battle royal. But there's another thing that Fred Silverman is known for, a moment of television history that has been called, and I quote from the book Live from New York, an oral history of Saturday Night Live by Tom Shales and Andrew Miller, quote, one of the meanest acts of character assassination in the history of character assassination. And it has to do with Fred Silverman, uh, Lorne Michaels, and a former Minnesota governor. Uh, So next week, we will be discussing the the SNL incident known only as a limo for a lame Okay. We will be finishing our trilogy, our, our 
Shapology next week with discussing the limo for a lamo incident in NBC history. That's next week. So join us next week for the shocking conclusion of of our Shapology with more Steve's historic approximation. And cut on that. <laughs>